In our last video of this week, we consider one more application of a complex function, namely the conformal mapping. Let us consider a complex function f in some domain z such that the derivative of this function never vanishes on this domain. As we pointed out earlier, the complex function can always be understood as a mapping between two complex domains, the domain of its argument and the domain of its values. So our goal now is to study some geometric properties of this mapping. Therefore, let us draw two complex planes, z and f. Let us take some point in the complex plane z, z0, and draw from it two infinitesimal complex numbers, dz1 and dz2. Obviously, the image of this point at the complex plane f is simply f of z0, while the images of complex numbers z0 plus dz1 and z0 plus dz2 are respectively f of z0 plus dz1 and f of z0 plus dz2. And making a Taylor expansion will obtain f of z0 plus the derivative of z at point z0 times dz1 and f of z0 plus the same derivative at point z0 times dz2. And this way we see that these two infinitesimal vectors dz1 and dz2 are transformed into infinitesimal vectors in f-plane df1 and df2 with the origin at point f of z0. And now let us study the relative positions of the initial vectors and the images of these vectors. To this end, we introduce their moduli and arguments. And also, let us express the derivative of the function at point z0 via its modulus and the arguments. Here gamma is its argument. Now we see that vector df1 is in fact the initial vector dz1, but rotated by angle gamma and stretched with the coefficient defined by the modulus of our derivative. And the same holds for vector df2. Now what I'd like to draw your attention to is that we see that both of our initial vectors are multiplied by the same stretching number and rotated by the same angle. And that means that the mapping implemented by our function doesn't change the angle between the vectors. Now I leave it up to you to prove that the infinitesimal circle in complex domain of Z is transformed into also the infinitesimal circle in complex domain of F. This way we come to quite a unique property. The mapping which doesn't change the angle between crossing curves and which transforms infinitesimal circles into infinitesimal circles is called a conformal mapping. As we see, it was crucial for our discussion that the modulus of the derivative at this point doesn't vanish. And we can say that any holomorphic function with non-vanishing derivative in some region z implements a conformal mapping of this region. Well, in reality, the condition is slightly more strict. The function also needs to be injective. But for our preliminary discussion, the definition we just discussed is more or less enough. What I would really like you to learn, however, is how to build the images of the contours under conformal mappings. It is an essential skill in complex analysis, because whenever you deal with integral and you perform the change of complex variables, you need to understand how your initial contour is transformed according to the change of variables. And the change of variables will always be a conformal mapping. So let us see how this works on some simple example. We consider a right isosceles triangle with apices at the origin and at points 1 and i in a complex plane of z. And let us see how this triangle is transformed under conformal transformation made by function z squared. Let us draw a domain of function f. And let us split our holomorphic function into its real and imaginary parts f equals u plus iv, which is x squared minus y squared plus 
to i x y. So u equals x squared minus y squared while v equals 2xy. And now we simply study how three different segments are transformed. For example, the horizontal segment from 0 to 1. We introduce a parameterization x equals t, y equals 0, and t changes from 0 to 1. Then in the new complex plane, we'll obtain u equals t squared while v equals 0. And we see that it is transformed into a horizontal segment of unit length starting at point Z and pointing to the right. Now the vertical segment from 0 to i. Again, we introduce a parameterization x equals 0 while y equals t. And again, t changes from 0 to 1. And now we see that u equals minus t squared while again v equals 0. And therefore, the second segment is again transformed into a horizontal segment along u-axis, but pointing to the left, from 0 to negative 1. And finally, the hypotenuse. Its equation is y equals y minus x, and we introduce a parameterization x equals t, while y equals y minus t. And as before, t belongs to the segment from 0 to 1. This way, we obtain u equals 2t minus 1, while v equals 2t times y minus t. And to obtain a curve in uv plane, we simply express t as a function of u from our first equation. t equals u plus 1 over 2, and v now equals 1 plus u times 1 half of 1 minus u. And we obtain a parabolic curve 1 half minus 1 half u squared. So let us draw it. And indeed, we see that it connects two edge points, negative 1 and 1. And if you take the derivative of v function with respect to u, you will immediately see that it's equal to negative 1 and 1 at these edge points, meaning that the corresponding tangent angles are 45 degrees. So our angles are preserved, and this is how our conformal mappings manifest itself. On the other hand, the angle between cathet is not conserved. It used to be pi by 2 and it became pi. Think for yourself why this happened. And finally, the last topic which I'd like to discuss with you this week is the integration in the complex plane. Certainly, if we can define the sum of several complex numbers, the limit and the convergence notion, then we can also define the notion of an integral in the complex plane. Suppose we have some contour starting at point z1 and ending at point z2, gamma, and some analytic function f of z. Then we can split the contour into linear segments, delta z i, and compose the sum over i f of z i times delta z i, where the value of the function f of z i is taken on some point inside the segment delta z i. Then by shrinking the step of our partition delta z i, we obtain a well-defined limit, which is called in the integral of a complex function along contour gamma. This complex integral can be split into two two-dimensional integrals in a natural way. We substitute f with u plus iv and dz with dx plus i dy. And we obtain two real-valued integrals u dx minus v dy plus i u dy plus v dx. And as an example, let's consider an integral along the right upper quarter circle of the function f of z equals z. So u is equal to x while v equals y. And here we go, the integral now is x dx minus y dy plus i x dy plus y dx. Both of these integrands can be naturally organized into full differentials. The first one is 1 half of d of x squared minus y squared while the second one is the integral of d of xy. And then combining them into a single integral sign, we obtain 1 half of d of x squared minus y squared plus 2xyi, which is of course nothing but d z squared. And this way we obtain a complex antiderivative, and taking it at point i and 1, we obtain the answer, which is 1. As we see, the combination of these two real two-dimensional integrals can be reduced to a simple antiderivative, but in a complex plane. 
and we understand that the result of integration doesn't depend on the shape of the contour, but rather on the position of its initial and end point. There is a fundamental reason for this in complex analysis. It's hidden in the analyticity of our integrand, our integration function. And essentially, we will dedicate the rest of our course to the exploration of this unique property.